This, it is now a done deal. The United States and Russia have completed their largest prisoner exchange since the fall of the Soviet Union. It was a massive swap involving 24 detainees, seven countries, and months of behind-the-scenes negotiations. The U.S. citizens released in the deal were flown to Texas early in the morning for medical evaluations. Journalist Evan Gerskovich and former Marine Paul Whelan were two of the highest-profile prisoners who were released alongside several Russian opposition figures and activists. Now, earlier, the group was greeted at an airport in Maryland by U.S. President Joe Biden, who touted the importance of diplomacy. Newly freed and back on U.S. soil. A joyful reunion for these American prisoners and their families. Accompanied by President Joe Biden and presidential candidate Kamala Harris. Several reporters from the Wall Street Journal were waiting to greet their colleague Evan Gershkovich after 491 days of waiting. Gershkovich is the most high-profile prisoner involved in the swap. He was jailed in 2023 and convicted of espionage charges that he and the U.S. government vehemently denied. He was one of 24 released, 16 by the West and 8 by Russia. They include former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan and U.S. Russian radio journalist Alzu Kermasheva. <laughs> the exchange was complex and involved some difficult choices. President Biden acknowledged concessions made by countries like Germany and Slovenia. And then when I said... Alliances make a difference. He stepped up, they took a chance for us. It mattered a lot. So the light is at home. The Russian side is also counting a win. Convicted hackers and several Russian nationals detained in the West for spying were welcomed home into the open arms of President Vladimir Putin. Among them, a Russian couple convicted of spying in Slovenia, along with their two children. Relations between Russia and the West have been at an all-time low since Moscow's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. But this prisoner swap shows that at least some channels of communications remain open. Well, I'm joined now by a prominent Russian human rights lawyer, Ivan Pavlov. Mr. Pavlov defended Alexei Navalny's anti-corruption foundation before he himself fled Russia and for his own safety. We are not disclosing his location. Mr. Pavlov, it's good to have you with us. Um, there is this perception here in the West that this was an exchange of two very different kinds of people. Russia handed over people that it had wrongfully detained. The United States and other countries handed over to Russia people who were clearly criminals. Is that how you see it? Yes, it's uh, it's a true, and, and uh, of course, you know, uh, Putin shows his uh, his real face uh, when he just divided Russian citizens on a two kinds of group, which uh, one group is he desirable, and uh, another group like human rights activists, uh, like uh, civil activists, like anti-war activists, like undesirable for, for the regime. And uh, they they uh, bring home un uh, desirable uh, Russians and uh, uh, took away uh, Russian people who are undesirable. Let me ask you about the release of Vadim Krasikov, who you may know yourself, who murdered an exiled dissident right here in Berlin. The fact that he has been released, the fact that he is a, basically a free man now in Russia, does that make you worry more for your own safety, the thought that a, a murderer can be sent back to Russia who could possibly murder again? Oh, we, we actually, you know, if we will think about it very focusedly, uh, it will be paralyze our work. Of course, you know, even without Krasikov, uh, um, 
you know, we, we had enough risks uh, to continue our work in exile. Uh, but we understand that uh, Putin has a, a lot of resources to, 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 to make many obstacles for us, even, even in exile. So, but uh, if you will think too much about this, it will be paralyze our work. We trying not focus on it. What do you think the, the message, Putin's message is um, with this exchange? It, is part of the message uh, to suppress those who speak out against him inside and outside of Russia? I think this is a message, um, yeah, for, you know, international community. And uh, I, I understand that Putin now uh, won't look like... Uh, peaceful person who is uh, ingotiable uh, who able to uh, who able to in- make negotiation pe- peaceful negotiation and uh, um, he wants to to demonstrate like a good example that he can uh, that he is person that international community can speak with so uh, it's a sign for international community and, of course, for, for internal community, for internal audience mm-hmm. also, because he brings Russians home. But nobody speaks in, inside Russia that he suffer and other Russians, you know, he, he yeah. not suffer. He, he just push them out. Uh, but, but the optics, uh, Mr. Pavlov, the optics of this, the, though, how, how it looks, we know that Vladimir Putin is very aware of his image and of the optics surrounding him. Um, this looks makes him look like he's a winner, doesn't it? He's operated from a position of strength. He's been able to force basically the West to negotiate with him to get its people back. I mean, this has been a, a win-win for him, hasn't it? I think so. I think so. He he looked like a winner in, in, in this exchange. And of course, we're glad that uh, our colleagues who was detained many years already in, in a prison, uh, now he's, uh, they, they are free. But unfortunately, uh, Russia still has a, a lot of uh, political prisoners inside. And, uh, you know, they are under huge risk uh, for their lives. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, West doesn't have so many spies to, to make exchange them on a, on a, a Russian political prisoners. But before I let you go, Mr. Pepper, so let me just ask you, let me ask you about the timing of this. Why do you think Vladimir Putin agreed to this prisoner swap now? Because, you know, it's, you know, it's not only about Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin uh, has a huge uh, system of the special forces. And a uh, uh, few times ago, uh, you know, uh, like uh, in a, in a, his interview for uh, uh, Carlson, uh, he told that he wants uh, Krasikov. Uh, he wants that Krasikov was returned to Russia, and uh, he he is ready to make negotiation. And all of the you know all of the system which stands behind the Putin, uh, like uh, special forces, mm-hmm. like uh, diplomatic corpus started to work very focusedly that to return Krasikov back to Russia. And they tra- they started to, to bargain with, with uh, you know, foreign uh, colleagues. Mm-hmm. And that's what, uh, now, now Krasikov back. And uh, the system now demonstrates that Putin that, uh, you know, the, it, it works very well. Okay. Exiled Russian human rights attorney, Ivan Pavlov. Mr. Pavlov, we appreciate you taking the time. Um, We know this is um, not necessarily easy for you to talk with this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Western nations released eight prisoners, among them a Russian agent convicted of murder here in Berlin, as we were mentioning. For the Kremlin, the release of FSB hitman Vadim Krasikov was a deal breaker. For German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, it was a difficult but necessary decision. Prisoner exchanges are delicate, whatever the circumstances. But this one had particular relevance for Germany. And German Chancellor Olaf Scholz played a pivotal role in executing the swap. 
that's because the key figure returning back to Russia was this man, Vadim Krasikov. He was sentenced to life in prison for the 2019 murder in Berlin of a Georgian who had fought alongside Chechen militants. It was a politically complicated decision for Germany, not least because of the brazenness of the murder. It took place in broad daylight in a Berlin park, just minutes away from the parliament and chancellery. Nothing makes this decision to deport a murderer sentenced to life imprisonment after only a few years in prison an easy one. The state's interest in enforcing the prison sentence had to be weighed up against the freedom and danger to life and limb of innocent people imprisoned in Russia and those unjustly imprisoned for political reasons. US President Joe Biden acknowledged Germany's vital role in the deal. I particularly own a great sense of gratitude to the Chancellor. The demands they were making of me required me to get some significant concessions from Germany, which they originally concluded they could not do because of the person in question. A collaborative effort then that required coordination, cooperation and some sacrifice among allied partners. But a successful outcome for those brought home and reunited at last with their families. DW political correspondent Julia Saldelli, she's following this story for us here in Berlin. Julia, there was a lot of opposition here in Germany to releasing Vadim Krasikov. What changed? I don't think there is one in single thing that changed that uh, brought the German government to <clears throat> agree to go ahead with the deal. I think it was a longer process of convincing the German government that it was a uh, necessary to uh, release Vadim Krasikov to go ahead with the deal. Obviously, the German government and Chancellor Olaf Scholz were in a big dilemma. On the one hand, the need to assert the state's interest to keep uh, this person in jail. He was convicted to a life sentence for the murder of another person while he was acting, the judges here believe, on the orders of, of Vladimir Putin. And on the other hand, to secure and guarantee the safety, the life and the freedom of the people who were uh, prisoners in Russia and Belarus, and that included German citizens, so obviously mm -hmm. a direct interest uh, from the German government to, uh, to release them. Julia, Germany is home to many who have sought refuge from the Russian government. Uh, how do these people feel about someone like Vadim Krasikov running free again? Well, clearly, they, I imagine they do not see that as a positive piece of news, the fact that uh, someone who was uh, working for uh, the intelligence services in Russia, who Putin himself had likely directed to kill someone uh, in Germany, a political opponent in Germany, uh, I don't imagine people are rejoicing about that. But on the other hand, especially looking at uh, part of the Russian community, those the dissidents, those who don't agree with Putin's Russia, it is also one of the first pieces of good news to come out of Russia in a long time. They are relieved that now a lot of Russian uh, opposition figures have been released. And uh, obviously they know the price that has been paid for this, but still there is a feeling of relief. Our political correspondent, Julia Saldelli, with the latest here in Berlin. Julia, thank you. Well, as we mentioned, American journalist Evan Gershkovich was among those released in the prisoner swap, the end of an ordeal for the Wall Street Journal reporter. So to uh, speak more about this, let's bring in Jody Ginsburg, who is the CEO of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Welcome to DW. So what was your reaction when you heard the news that Evan Gershkovich and, let's not forget, Russian-American journalist Alsu uh, Kermasheva had been freed? Well, I was absolutely delighted. We've been campaigning for Evan's release for more than a year. He's been in detention for nearly 500 days, much of that in solitary confinement. Alsu has been prevented from leaving Russia since May of last year. So this is a fantastic moment to see those pictures, to see those images of Evan and Alsu free and soon to be meeting their families. But of course, it's bittersweet. We know, of course, that these individuals are innocent. They committed no crimes, although uh, the Russians tried to accuse them of espionage, but their crimes were the fact that they were 
journalists who were then used as political hostages and they've been exchanged, unfortunately, for convicted criminals, as you say, uh, such as an assassin who was convicted in a German court. Let's talk a little bit more about what you just said there, actually, um, which is that many observers have said that Gershkovitz's arrest is essentially a Russian policy that amounts to hostage taking. So how much of a problem has this become? I think it's becoming increasingly a problem. This is effectively state-sponsored hostage taking. It was clear from the outset that the Kremlin wanted a high level prisoner with whom they could swap uh, for the individuals that they wanted out. Of course, what you get with a journalist is you get a sort of double result because you get a political hostage that you can hopefully exchange, but you also send a powerful signal to other journalists that perhaps they might be next. So it has a chilling effect on journalists and journalism in the country. And that was certainly true in Russia after Evans' arrest. We saw journalists leaving the country. We saw newsrooms pulling out their journalists. And so that, that I think there is a real risk, especially now that we've seen this effectively move be successful for the Kremlin, that we may see it repeated in future. Jody, reporting from hostile regions of the world, as we all know, comes with, uh, with many dangers, let's say. Is there anything that can be done to strengthen protections for journalists who are simply carrying out their work? Absolutely. I think, first of all, you have to raise the stakes so that it is not attractive to regimes to take journalists hostage in this way, that they knowledge, for example, that uh, governments and individuals who infringe on journalists' human rights and right to report freely might fa find themselves faced with sanctions, for example. Um, uh, and we have to make sure that, that countries like the US, like Germany, continue to advocate strongly for press freedom, not just internationally, but also on their home territories. We leave it there. Jody Ginsburg from the Committee to Protect Journalists joining us from New York tonight. Thank you. Thank you.